Afternoon to everybody who has joined in. I think we'll get started. So thanks everybody for, for being able to join today. Uh, we're going to have another talk that's sort of following on the theme of test beds. We've had a couple of these so far this year. We're going to have a couple more uh, in the middle of the summer. And this was a recommended talk from uh, the folks down at uh, Central Florida. Uh, but I'd like to give a warm welcome to Kobus van der Berve, uh, from the University of Utah. And he's going to be talking a little bit about the, the powder platform. Uh, which is a mobile and wireless research platform. So, Kobus, if you want to share and get going, we can we can get started. Sounds good. Well, thank you all for uh, invitation. Uh, as I said earlier to uh, Jason, I very much prefer <clears throat> folks asking questions as we go along. So please do interrupt me, and uh, I might even remember to. Just pause and uh, see if there are questions. Um, okay, so uh, nowadays when we talk about powder, we kind of talk about uh, our ecosystem, quote unquote. Of course, there is the platform uh, depicted here in the bottom right, um, but we have sort of expanded what we do. So powder at this point is also an open RAN open test and integration center. So that's sort of a separate push. And then as part of the uh, NSF uh, SciNerds program, uh, we have become a prototype radio dynamic zone. And I'll briefly touch on all three of, of these components, but then yeah, the, the, the bulk of the talk uh, will be uh, about the, the powder platform itself. So uh, this, Picture on the on the right is I often refer to as our um, cartoon picture of of the platform, but will give you sort of a sense of the the scope um, of of what we have. So we have uh, rooftop nodes. So again, powder is mobile and wireless. So we have radios on rooftops. Uh, we in fact often co-located with <clears throat> um, commercial uh, wireless providers. We have a massive MIMO system through our collaboration with, with Rice University. We have what we call dense endpoints, but you know all of these things are sort of from a radio perspective, you can think of as just base stations. And then we have a, a private front hall network to a near edge compute facility, and we have other uh, compute clusters uh, from our other test base at the University of Utah uh, that is actually federated with other places too. Uh, sort of in the back of that. Um, and then we have a, a small indoor over the air environment, again, wireless uh, radios that can operate in a, a close proximity. So you don't have to worry about uh, RF front ends and uh, distances and coverage. And, and then we have, a, again, a small controlled RF environment um, where you can programmatically control the uh, uh, attenuation be between these uh, radios. And they may have a, a number of configurations for endpoints. Right? So, so think of an endpoint as your cell phone uh, in the nomenclature of, of wireless. We talk about the UE, the user equipment. Um, so we have some of those that are what we call fixed endpoints. I have a picture coming up in a little bit. So sort of human height side of a building. We have some of these that are on buses campus shuttles that, that go around the campus and then we have portable versions of that. So, so that's sort of the, the hardware infrastructure. Um, and the, the, the goal of this uh, infrastructure or, or platform is to enable fundamental uh, research and then also uh, testing and development and, and teaching. And the way we like to think of this is that it's a bunch of building blocks. Legos, hardware, software, and then you can come in and sort of compile them into an experiment that, that makes uh, sense of you. And a lot of the, the platform software that I'll briefly touch on, on later uh, makes that uh, real. Um, and then to make that happen, we have a very sophisticated uh, control framework. Um, we are an FCC innovation zone that helps a little bit with spectrum access. Again, as a, as a wireless test, but that's a pretty crucial thing. And then we, we try to make the whole platform 
uh, available as uh, bring your own device, bring your own software facility, and and we have examples of how that has uh, has been has been realized. Uh, so, uh, sort of key takeaway: highly flexible, real world lab as a service. That that's how we think uh, of of this platform. So, just and and this is not the thing that you can do with it, but just to as an, an illustrated example to to make it a little bit more real for you. Um, given this whole framework, you can go from nothing, right? There, there's no network there to an operational 5G network in, in 30 minutes. And, the, and that 30 minutes actually includes uh, a fresh download of the uh, the base station software and a recompile of that. So if, if we just run with binaries, it, it's less than 10 minutes. Um, and then uh, what that looks like uh, in the end is you, you have these base stations. Um, this is where we, we run the software that you compile. There's some sort of core 5G network. Um, and then we have the buses going around campus and that becomes part of your experiment as well. And you can access that remotely. And so we have these COTS UEs, right? So think cell phone, although they, these are more like a modem, not, not a cell phone. And now uh, the the buses, <clears throat> excuse me. There's one of the bus routes, and so they they go around, and you know, as as they come within uh, coverage of of one of these base stations, they connect. And this is all open source, and you have remote access, and it's instrumentable, and you can collect data. Right? That's sort of a, a an example. Uh, I'd say fairly sophisticated experiment that that we can stand up in 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 very little time. Um, there's a, a video that I'm, I'm not going to, oops, maybe I should convince it, but I don't want to uh, look at that. Uh, so in terms of the Powder OTIC, so the Open Test and Integration Center, um, it's focused on Open RAN and 5G, NextG related testing. So, you know, think things related to the way uh, mobile networks are uh, being built nowadays with uh, this aggregation of the, the base station. Um, and and the, the key thing that we realized as we started, and, and this is mostly uh, through our interaction with non-academic users, that we realized is that a lot of this testing today is done manually. Um, and, and that's really not the way to do it, right? And so we're a, we're a pretty small team and everything for us is about uh, automated access to the resources. So that's what we did here as well. So we built this, uh, what we call test orchestration, test automation framework. And, and at a high level, you can think of it as we have two versions that we're exploring at the moment. One is Stackstorm based and the other one is Daxter based. But there's some testing workflow and that would interact with the platform itself to orchestrate the test setup, right? So it's like, I, I want this the configuration like so, I want the software, that kind of thing. And then you would iterate here through steps two, three, and four, where you might change the configuration, run your test, collect the data, and rinse and repeat. Um, and so uh, this is an example uh, that this is actually an example that, that we're currently doing with, um, with a, a commercial vendor. Um, you have your radio equipment, and, and in the case of, of that vendor, this is on a rooftop node, um, connected through that fiber front hole to uh, the disaggregated base station functionality. Again, in a nomenclature, they talk about the distributed unit and the centralized unit, but it's basically the base station that's been disaggregated, the core network part, and then sort of uh, test server at, the, at, at, at both ends. Um, and then we run automated testing uh, through that. <clears throat> um, so this is a different uh, illustrative e example. We've been working with a private 5G vendor and we've deployed their radios in two of our enclosures. Uh, so this is sort of logically what the picture looked like. Uh, the pinkish stuff is our normal path. Uh, so CWDM to take us to that near edge compute facility, a software defined radio. Um, going to an antenna. And so to accommodate them, we added an RF switch. And so we can decide whether we use our radio or their radio. Um, and we have this deployed now and, you know, they have their engineers from somewhere not in the US that make use of this to do mobility testing of, of their equipment using this uh, uh, automation framework uh, that we developed. 
And then the, the third piece is this radio dynamic zone. Um, and without going into all the nitty gritty details here, you can basically think of a radio dynamic zone as the flip of a radio quiet zone. So there are these areas in the US where, uh, where they do uh, radio uh, telescope kind of work and no other RF transmissions are allowed, right? If you go into that, you have to turn off your cell phone and so on. And so the radio dynamic zone is a concept that says, well, let, let's flip that around, right? If you want to do RF transmissions and testing, here's a place where you can go um, and do that testing in a way that is safe and won't impact any of the other uh, spectrum users. And of course, this is basically what we're trying to do with powder anyway. And so, so as part of this program, we, we, we're prototyping uh, that kind of functionality um, in, in powder. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of, of the architecture, but there's a, a spectrum intelligence, as it were, that kind of knows what's going on in the spectral environment, and then it can uh, dictate to the, the test bed what spectrum to use and, and what not to use. And so again, here's an illustrative example. Uh, this figure here is a spectrogram, so it's uh, sort of time is in the on the on the y-axis, and then the uh, spectrum on the on the x-axis. Uh, so there are CBRS operators in our area, and there's a C-band operator. I forget who that is. Maybe it's uh, Verizon. Um, and so the in in this context, again, we're a wireless test bed, and so if you want to stand up one of these uh, test five G systems. Well, we need to do that in a way where we don't interfere with the other uh, spectrum users. And that's uh, up to this point before we had the, the RDZ work going on, we would do that manually, right? So you would start it up and see where the spectrum is used or not, um, <clears throat> and, and then use a, a non-used space. But now with this uh, RDZ work, we can, we can automate, right? And so, these are the, the other users in our environment, and then it basically selects this quiet part of the spectrum uh, to, to operate in. Um, so that's my high level of you know all three of these components. So let me let me pause there. Uh, any any questions, comments so far? No, we don't have any in the chat room so far. Okay, no one? A shy bunch. All right. So uh, with that background, what, what are users doing with, with Powder? And you know, in the first instance, we're an academic research platform. And our users use the platform for a broad range of uh, related uh, research areas, mobile networking, wireless security, wireless communications, so lower, lower level five physical layer stuff. RF propagation, modeling, analysis, next G systems, wireless uh, machine learning, and, and so on. Um, we, we maintain a, a list of uh, powder users where we verify the, that they've, they've used the platform. And, and we're up to 51 papers at, at this point. So uh, something that we, we track and, and is growing. Uh, then I kind of alluded to that earlier. We are. When we started out as part of the Power program, um, NSF was clear that they wanted us to also uh, think of making the platform available for non-academic use. So that could be research or testing uh, or development. And, and so we have a, a bunch of use cases uh, around that. One of the so areas- We did have one question come oh, in yeah, if please. you would like. Uh, uh, Vinod is asking, do you think that 5G will be a viable replacement for campus Wi-Fi for most schools in the future? Uh, I don't think so. I, th I think it's complementary. Um, I, I do think uh, the, the exciting thing in, in terms of thinking of um, campus 5G uh, is that it's becoming possible. And, and, and this is... Uh, the FCC has a, a big push to uh, make spectrum use more, more flexible. And so the, one of the, the key examples there is the CBRS band, uh, citizen broadband, something. Um, and for folks who, who don't know about that, uh, the basic idea is this is spectrum that 
uh, used to be exclusively allocated for government use, specifically um, uh, maritime radar systems. Actually, I think there's another incumbent, uh, but but mostly uh, Navy ships that uh, could use this the spectrum. And then, uh, of course, the realization is most of the U.S. Uh, don't have ships. Um, and so there's all this spectrum that um, is not being used. And so out of that came the, the CBRS spectrum sharing ecosystem. Um, and yeah, so to tie this back to the, the question, uh, there are many campuses exploring using CBRS for private 5G kind of deployments. Uh, there's actually not us, one of our par partners on, on campus is doing that at the University of Utah as well. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, and so to back to the question, I don't think it's going to replace Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi is pretty uh, ubiquitous and it works pretty well. I think there are areas where one would be better than the other. So I, I do think of it as uh, mostly complementary. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> okay, so so back to uh, sort of the, what, what people are uh non-academic use of the platform, uh, as it were. I, I mentioned the open RAN uh, push, as it were. And, and again, that you can think of as a base station, you know, radio that we see on cell towers. And there's a big push to disaggregate that, to, to leave the radio on the pole, as it were, but then to say, oh, you know, what, what, what if we, all the higher level, Processing. What if we put that in a data center or maybe in an edge cloud facility nearby? Um, because then more of it is software and you can more easily upgrade things and change it and so on and so forth. So there's a big push in, in that direction. So we've been supporting, uh, there's an uh, organization called the ORAN Alliance and they have these plug fests. So we've been supporting them uh, quite a bit. Uh, this, this picture here is of an energy saving use case. Um, you know, and, and again, just sort of background here, uh, there's a lot of demand for spectrum, of course, but not all the time. So in the middle of the night, maybe you don't want to have these things running because there's, there's not a lot of demand for it. Um, same organization, the ORAN Alliance have an open software community and, and they're using our uh, facilities uh, quite extensively. I kind of talked about these uh, before when I talked about our, our OTIC uh, stuff. So th this is a picture of uh, work that we're doing with, with Mavenir where uh, bring your own device. So this is one of their radios on um, a rooftop. Um, and then this is one of the endpoints also on a rooftop and we're doing testing with them. This is a picture of the private 5G work that we're doing. Um, other uh, non-academic use as well, the US Navy did some measurements. Um, there's a, a company, uh, a small startup that were funded by DOD that did some spectrum sharing work. Um, yeah, other sort of just radio related uh, testing uh, using uh, the platform. Very quickly in terms of numbers, uh, we have uh, at this point more than 300 projects. So for us, a project is, it's typically a, a, a PI that comes in and says, oh, you know, I want to do research on X, Y, Z. And, and then uh, he or her students can join that project. Right? So that's roughly how we think of, a, of a, proje a project. And so users join projects. So we have more than uh, 1,100 uh, users. Uh, we have uh, more than a thousand profiles. So profiles are recipes that basically says, you know, here is how I want to make use of this platform. I want these resources, I want them connected like so. Um, and then experiments for, for us, an experiment is any resources that are being instantiated for whatever purpose, right? That would, if I spin up uh, a radio with a compute node, that would be an experiment. And, and so we put close to 20,000 uh, experiments at this point. This is just our uh, experimental hours uh, since the beginning of time, right? We started out there around here and you can see things go up and down. And, and this is experiment hours counted across all the active uh, resource uh, resources on that day, right? So all the users and all the equipment 
adding all of them up, uh, we're hovering around 300 um, experiment hours per day. Okay, uh, so let me pause there again. That was very quick overview of, of powder, what people are using it for. Any, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll go into lessons. Uh, none right now. Okay. Uh, all right, well, so, <laughs> you know, a lot of lessons are pretty obvious after the fact. Um, so first of all, it, it takes an ex exceptional team. Um, I, as I'll be showing as, as we go along, this is quite uh, a complex uh, infrastructure and, and this is the team that, that made that happen because we have lots of partners, uh, primarily NSF that, that sponsored it, but uh, lots of other uh, partners that, that were really crucial in enabling uh, the, the infrastructure. So the first sort of, and again, this is an obvious lesson, right? But um, yes, this is one project, but really it's many projects in one. And the first one is, well, it's a construction project uh, because we have all this stuff that needs to be deployed and put on roofs. Um, so this is what our rooftop nodes look like, right? So we have this uh, temperature controlled box uh, that gets deployed on the roof. And then we put our equipment uh, in that. This is one of our antennas. Um, and yeah, these things are, you know, three by three by three, uh, pretty big. You need a actual moving crew to, to get that on a roof and, and you don't want to break the membrane and, you know, all these kinds of things that, uh, that make it hard and interesting. Uh, th this is what our fixed endpoints look like. Again, a, a temperature control box uh, on the side of a building, so human height, um, and the equipment goes in there. Um, this is what our dense nodes look like. So you might have seen these with uh, especially densification uh, projects. It basically looks like a lamppost, and then there's a cabinet at the bottom where the equipment goes in. Um, and then, okay, well, if you have the infrastructure deployed, then this is sort of more of a typical deployment project at this point. Right? So we have uh, off-the-shelf equipment, in this case, uh, uh, compute nodes and, and, and uh, network equipment. And so now you interconnect all of these and, and make it into a, a useful, uh, useful infrastructure. Of course, if we have stuff on roofs, then you know, some of this uh, deployment uh, activities <clears throat> happens on roofs. And you know, we, you know, people had to do um, training uh, to safely go on these roofs. Uh, it's not quite obvious here, but you know, this gentleman stands very gingerly to the side of the building because there's a big drop off on the other side. Uh, this, these are the massive MIMO radios uh, that uh, we collaborated with, uh, with RICE on. Um, and then we are using what is essentially uh, lab equipment in a non-lab environment. So a lot of that is design and prototyping and assembly and then yes, deployment, right? So this is roughly what uh, one of those fixed endpoints look like inside. Logically, this is uh, what it is. There's uh, the antennas, of course. So this is the, the black uh, spots here on the side. Um, and then there might be an RF front end. And then there's a bunch of software defined radios in there. And there's a, a small form factor compute node in there. And, and so all of the green stuff makes up the experimental uh, equipment. Um, and then the, the purple stuff is the outer band access and control. And that we get to that either through commercial LTE or Wi-Fi, right? And so again, the idea is that you, know, you allocate resources and then you can come in uh, remotely and touch that as it were. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, an, another, a different but related project. So the mobile endpoints, again, same story. The logical picture is actually the same, but now it goes in a box in the back of a bus and buses do what buses do, right? So you have a driver and they start up in the morning and they go on a route and then maybe they decide to change a route and or they, you know, take a break and they turn the, the power off. And so we, the, the challenge here then became, becomes the, the management with respect to the power supply that is not reliable. And uh, we have our experimental uh, node typically runs Linux. And so 
we have a battery in there so that it can stay up for a little while and we can shut it down gracefully uh, in between these uh, uh, things that, that buses do. Um, we had to, again, because we, we build uh, or we make use of really lab equipment in an outside environment, uh, we needed to develop RF front ends to increase the, the RF power um, of these systems. And this is sort of the, the latest uh, incarnation of that, if you will. Uh, there's a FPGA control board, and then the actual RF front end is sort of a plug-in on, on top of that. Um, and this is what it looks like uh, once it's deployed in, in one of those uh, dense nodes. All right, as a, as a cyber infrastructure or a test bed or a platform, of course, a big part of this is the experimental workflow. Uh, so I'm sure much like in, in other test beds, users come in through a portal. Um, in our world, we have this notion of a, a profile, which you can think of as a recipe, as I said before, of you know, these other things. Here's how I wanna, here's how I want to combine the building blocks. Um, and you select that. And then the control framework takes over and instantiate it for you. Um, and once it's uh, instantiated, you have remote access to that. And so again, the notion here is hardware building blocks, software building blocks, and you can sort of mix and match uh, to, to put that together. But all of that is uh, managed through this uh, experimental workflow and control framework. Because we're an RF uh, uh, infrastructure or a wireless infrastructure, um, a key thing for us was to monitor the actual spectrum used, right? And so uh, we have these experimental software defined radios and they can use within their capabilities pretty much any spectrum. So that's an obvious, um, <laughs> an obvious issue, right? If you have a, a PhD student that accidentally start using a spectrum that we're not allowed to use, uh, well, that might not go well in, in terms of our uh, program experimental licenses and permissions that we have from the, from the FCC. So the, the picture here is we, we came up with this uh, monitoring system that if this is the experimental radio and normally it would just be connected to the antenna, but we, we make that RF path go through a, a bidirectional coupler and so in essence, we siphon off a little bit of the signal. And then the point of that is to figure out what spectrum the experimental radio is actually using so that we can turn it off if they use spectrum that they're not allowed to. Now, this turns out to be actually quite a complex thing because the, the antenna is of course receiving signals that are being transmitted by other radios. And so trying to figure out what is coming from the experimental radio versus what's coming in from the antenna, uh, like I said, turned out to be quite a challenging problem. Okay, so then moving on. So that's sort of plat platform software, <clears throat> but one of the things that we, we learned real early on is, um, and, and I wanna say different from other test beds that, that we have operated or are operating, there's just a lot more handholding that is needed to make, uh, especially open source stacks work in this real real world environment, right? It's, it's not good enough to just say, oh, you know, here, here's your hardware, uh, go ahead, make use of it. There, there's a lot more tuning and uh, debugging uh, that needs to take place. Uh, so we put a lot of effort into uh, domain software and, and our focus uh, again, has been through collaboration with Rice uh, on the on Massive MIMO. So they have a, a couple of software stacks that they provide, and then in in our uh, on our side, 5G, NextG related, and and Open RAN. And again, I'm I'm not going to go through the details here, but uh, the key idea here is that. Uh, well, I, I will speak to maybe the stop one just to give you a sense. So again, think of this as the UE. This is the smartphone. This is the base station. This is the core network. And, and we can do that in an emulated environment, <clears throat> or we can move to what we call a workbench environment where, yes, it's transmitting, but it's transmitting over a coax cable, or you can actually transmit over the air in our indoor over the air environment, or you can go outside. 
And this is typically also the, the flow that we try to suggest to our users. You know, you start out here in the emulated environment, figure out what it is that you want to do, and then you just change a parameter, <coughs> excuse me, in your profile. And now that same software can be instantiated in, in one of these other uh, configurations. So <laughs> this is again, well, yeah, this is very obvious. If, if you're a wireless uh, uh, test bit, access to spectrum is critical. Uh, I think it's fair to say we underestimated how hard that would be. I think it's fair to say NSF underestimated how hard it would be. And just to give you a, a little bit of a flavor, uh, so this uh, plots here show spectrum hues across a band. What is it like uh, 2200 to 2700? So this is uh, uh, megahertz. Uh, this is a band that we started using and the, the top, uh, graph here was October 2020, and the bottom one is May 2021. And you can see how that filled up over that five month, month period. Um, and this was very unfortunate for us because <laughs> we were using, you know, we have a program experimental license and we were making use of this. And of course, by the time it filled up to this point, well, we couldn't use it anymore. Um, we would either cause interference or more likely these are commercial uh, cellular users. Their power was just uh, too much. It just completely overwhelmed um, our um, radios. Um, this is a similar story for, for CBRS. Uh, this is uh, October 21 and then uh, January 2022. And you can see this sort of filling up as well as, as more uh, CBRS, CBRS users uh, come uh, online. So this, this remains a big, big, big challenge uh, for us. Um, and uh, yeah, something that we continue to, uh, to have to explore. Okay, so that was sort of power specific. Uh, I have a few, a little bit more generic, although I, I guess that, that might still be somewhat power specific, other lessons. Um, and again, most of them in retrospect is like, yeah, that's that's pretty obvious. Uh, so, you know, this is a big project for you or for us as the case, but for other people, this is just another project, right? Um, and they have their own priorities, right? I remember distinctly, we had this, we were trying, we were on a on a tight deadline. We we're trying to get our, our fiber deployment done. And yeah, you know, there was a, a fiber connectivity that they needed to deploy for the upcoming football season. And, you know, of course we don't, we can't rank against those. So uh, we were lower in priority. And so you have this continuous ten tension between trying to be a good citizen, good citizen or a good corporate partner, as it were, um, and escalating to say, hey, you know, this, this project is, is really important and NSF is breathing down my neck. Um, I kind of alluded to this one before. Uh, so most of the equipment we have deployed are, are really lab equipment, but now we want to use this in this real world environment. And the reason for that is to get the flexibility, right? software-defined radios as opposed to a radio that is uh, very dedicated to a specific environment, because that's, that's really the point of a testbed. Um, and the point of the testbed is also to explore these kind of transmissions in a real-world environment. But doing that is, is actually quite hard. Uh, similar or related story, from a research perspective, open source is great, right? Because you can instrument it, you can see exactly what's going on. But yeah, you know, a lot of this open source stacks have, are only really being used in lab environments or very small controlled environments. And now we're like, ah, oh, now we, we're going to use it outside. Um, and and they often they just not stable or uh, sophisticated enough, right? So there was a lot of work that we had to put into that uh, to make it uh, viable. The other one, and again, this is kind of obvious, but in our domain, uh, the domain science is just uh, evolving very rapidly, right? So when we started out this project, 5G was just sort of emerging. And now it's like, well, <laughs> 6G, <laughs> or at least 5G and beyond. Um, Open RAN that I mentioned a couple of times, again, when we started, it was this research project, right? There was sort of a couple of people working on that. And now there's this massive industry push uh, in, in that direction. Um, 
and so for, from our perspective, this calls for a continued uh, effort to, to build these building blocks, to have relevant building blocks that would uh, our users can use to, to do their research uh, without having to go through all this pain themselves, right? And, and that's maybe sort of one of the significant value adds uh, that we provide. Um, this one, again, you know, this is obvious, but um, hard, hard to wrap your head around that. There's, there's significant tension between providing a platform that's really flexible and the complexity that that uh, therefore uh, comes from that. And so you kind of want to, you know, work your way through that and, and come up with something that, yes, is flexible, but it's not super flexible uh, because that's complex to do. And maybe it's also harder for, you, for users uh, to use. Related to the earlier point, uh, this is a sophisticated platform um, and it, it really is, is not easy to use. So, so we have all these things that we do, the, pl the, the profiles that I mentioned and on and on. But, you know, even, I mean, I, I talk to faculty at, at other universities and uh, it's hard for them to map their research objectives to what we have. Um, and this is one that wasn't that obvious to us. Uh, so we've kind of adapted. We have more user tools. One of the key things that, that's really helpful uh, is just, well, if, if you want to make use of the platform, um, depending on what you want to do, but typically we insist that you do one-on-one -on -one office hours with us. Um, and, and in general, we just off, offer the office hours uh, anyway. Um, and that's been really successful, right? So having a, a 20 minute conversation uh, with one of our staff and you say, oh, you know, here's what I wanna do. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. Or, you know, what if, if, you, if you think of it like so, would that still satisfy your requirements? So that's been really useful. Again, a related point here is uh, we tend to cater to a really wide variety of skills. Right? So I, I mentioned the, uh, the small startup that were doing spectrum sharing. I mean, those guys were, they were winners of the DARPA spectrum challenge, really sophisticated users. And then you have uh, some undergrad or maybe a graduate student and they have questions about their C++ code that is not compiling, right? But because they're doing it on your platform is like, why is this not working? Um, so sort of that wide range of, of skills. And again, that, you know, it comes with the territory, but, but that is, um, it's, it's a challenge. And then maybe the, the final thing here um, was also not that obvious to us, but in retrospect, maybe it should have been. Uh, the needs of academic users and industry users are quite different, right? So academic users think flexibility, open source, stability is not that important, right? If, if I can run my narrow experiment that is gonna uh, serve the purpose of the paper I'm writing, that's it, right? If, if, if it runs for an hour and I can get my data, that's, that's good enough. And that's just not the way industry users think, right? So typically their interest, interests are much more specific, maybe even narrow, depending on, on where they want to go, right? They like, uh, well, do you, do you have this tool for me? Or do you have this specific thing that I'm having trouble with? Um, and then it's not a, oh yeah, you have an open source version of that. It has to be pretty stable and, and sophisticated. And so we ended up thinking of sort of the services that we provide uh, to these groups as, as, as largely two, two separate things. Uh, that's it, that's all I have. Um, any, any questions? Thank you for going through all that, Cobus. I'm going to open up the room so that if people do want to raise their hand or unmute themselves to ask questions, they can. So I had a, a couple that I sort of wrote down to start. You mentioned that, you know, going from the lab to sort of doing this out in the world in practice, you know, exposed sort of interesting challenges. Any specific anecdotes you want to sort of relay about maybe hardware failures or interesting software failures when you were trying to actually go forward with the, the physical implementation? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots and lots of um, examples there, but you know, I'll, I'll I'll pick one that's again pretty obvious. So we we have this stuff in buses. Well, you know, a bus is a, not a very friendly environment. They kind of shake a lot and. So you have these, oh, well, my connectors are coming loose or the antennas that I have 
connected to the back window are are falling off. Um, yeah, it's it's obvious, but it is kind of hard. And then, you know, we had temperature issues um, where uh, the buses get hot and then the equipment gets hot and. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and software wise, I, I think I kind of alluded to that, but most of these open source stacks and, and they're getting better, right? They, certainly over time, they, they're getting much better. But uh, traditionally, people would use this in a small lab environment. Um, and, and now you're saying, oh, well, we're going to run this over the air. Uh, in an environment where there are other spectrum users and the software might not like that, right? They might not be stable enough. Um, so yeah, those are some examples. Okay. I uh, don't see any other questions yet, but if people do want to chat, uh, put them into the chat or raise your hand or unmute, certainly do so. I've got uh, another one. Um, what what's sort of the the profile of of people using this when it's out there in the wild? You know, are there any particular days or times that are busier than others? You know, you you mentioned you know your, your collaborators preparing for football games. I'm assuming that since these are on the buses and they are available for for visitors, do you do you see upticks uh, in in use during events like that? No, and 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 something I I maybe should emphasize right is we're a testbed or a, a platform. So we don't provide any, uh, the, the services we provide are for wireless researchers, not for the common public, um, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, of course, the buses typically runs during the day. <laughs> so uh, when people use the buses, that's when they use it. Um, a lot of the other equipment uh, you can use uh, any time, uh, so don't have that that sort of uh, constraints um, uh, associated with it. Um, in terms of profile of users, it's really broad, right? I, um, I mean, we have, as I said, with uh, you know undergrad trying to compile something and you know, his code is not working. Uh, to some of these really sophisticated users that, I mean, we have a, a nice little, uh, well, nice little, we have a, we have a nice uh, graphical user interface uh, to our platform and experimental workflow. Uh, but once once folks get really sophisticated, they don't use that. They use the programmatic API, right? So then they would kind of uh, make allocations programmatically, uh, instantiate their experiment programmatically, run their tests, collect their data, uh, shut it all down, go home, right? And 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 so that's sort of the range from uh, people trying to compile something very basic um, to these really sophisticated uh, users. Uh, so yeah, pretty broad range. Okay. And I have one last one since we still don't have any others. Uh, you also mentioned that you know the technology is changing so rapidly. Uh, during the start of this, did you have any particular challenges in getting access to some of the new technology or do you, does that even persist today as, as things are moving up to 6G? Yeah, that's a good question. I Again, our emphasis, um, well, let me put it like this. Some of the equipment we use are just off the shelf equipment that you, know, you would put in a data center, uh, it's, I mean, they, we make sure they have the, the right features, but then compute nodes and networking gear. And uh, for the most part, it's off the shelf equipment that you can just expect to use. But in terms of the wireless side, that's where the flexibility comes in. Right? So we, we could have, uh, for argument's sake, uh, gotten early 5G equipment and deployed that, but that would have been closed uh, box, as it were, black box and wouldn't really have been useful to our users. So we very deliberately took this strategy to say, well, no, that, that part has to be software defined. We need software defined radios. But the moment you go there, it's like, well, okay, well, <laughs> what is the software that you can pair with that? And so that's the open source software and, and they exist, but uh, it took, uh, you know, maybe three years for them to evolve. There's sort of two main open source stacks for them to evolve from, where they were with uh, 4G stack to having that you can 
without blushing say yep this this looks like 5g and by the way it actually operates with a with an off-the-shelf um, ue or or, or uh, uh, smartphone uh, equivalent and and so that is is probably the of course the, you know people were using earlier stacks or uh, not not everyone is interested in 5g next g kind of things there are people doing uh, physical layer work and for them this is a great environment they just run their own software on these software defined radios uh, but in terms of sort of where people were expecting things to be, so uh, end-to-end 5G capabilities, that took a while to get there because, I mean, we, we're not developing all of that software, but uh, getting those, first of all, the open source stacks to, to develop enough and then for us to be able to say, oh, yeah, it works well enough that, that it will work in our environment, that, that took quite a long time. Okay. Uh, Doug, you have your hand up. Yeah, you'd mentioned that uh, it was challenging trying to decipher which signals were coming in via from the antenna versus which ones were coming from the experimental radio. And I'm just curious about, in a nutshell, what that solution was. Yeah, so uh, the basically um, um, a principal component uh, analysis kind of thing where you say, okay, let's let's separate these these out. Um, and uh, yeah, I would have to go back, look back at the paper. And, and the main proponent there was uh, was one of our ECE faculty who you know understand the RF uh, work much much better than I do. But uh, that that's the essence of it. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that was it for questions. So thank you again, Kobus, for going through all of this. If you want to send me a copy of those slides, I'll make sure that those get posted. And then for those that are still listening, uh, next week, I believe we have a talk from the University of South Carolina, and they are going to be talking about, uh, I think, some advancements in TCP fairness uh, with relation to round trip time. So thanks, everybody. Hope you all have a good weekend and talk to everybody soon.